Welcome to Profiles in Quality, an interview program with the leading names in quality management. I'm Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest and your host for this episode. This is part two of our interview with Sutter Davis Hospital CEO Janet Wagner. Sutter Davis is a nonprofit, 48-bed acute care hospital that offers care in four primary areas, medical surgical and intensive care, birthing, emergency care, and surgical services. In part two of our interview, we get her views on quality and what it means to apply those principles in a healthcare setting. Sir, so tell us a little bit about your background. You've been CEO here at Sutter Davis for, for how long? Oh, almost 15 years. And what were you doing before that? Before that, I um, was a chief nurse executive. Actually, my background is nursing. Okay. So I have a very rich background in nursing. I was lucky enough to practice nursing for many years as a nurse practitioner and also as a clinical specialist. And then somewhere in the 80s, I, I uh, moved over into administration and, um, and then was lucky enough to uh, join Sutter Health and become a CEO. I mean, obviously, as a CEO, you handle a lot of different aspects of a hospital, but where does quality come into play in it, and how did, let's say, the idea of quality first uh, show up on your radar? For me, quality in nursing, it was clinical quality to begin with, and then in the early 90s, I would say there was this total quality management movement. I jumped on board with that completely uh, and I am very much a Deming follower uh, in terms of framework. I have a two-year degree in Deming's work so I was uh, fortunate enough to um, uh, know of him before he passed away um, and I, I really did embrace his framework. I do believe it is a framework that works. Um, it's aligned with the Baldrige framework um, and I have applied it throughout my career. How do you apply Deming to uh, the, the, the patient experience or patient quality? How, how does that work for you? The biggest thing in terms of Deming's work is measurement. And so for me, it's extremely important to be able to measure what we're doing to know if we're improving or uh, making a difference in patient care delivery. So I would say that the, the largest part of Deming's work was understanding systems, understanding processes, being able to measure results over time, and and improve, make improvements. So, and that, that's that's key to the work that we do. Well, that would I, I could see where that would apply on, let's say, a clinical level. What about on a more holistic level? You know, the, the entire uh, the entire patient experience, of feeling good about the hospital, feeling good about the stay, aside from the actual healthcare aspect mm -hmm. of it. And that goes to the patient experience. So that we have um, we use the Prescani database to measure our patient experience. And now, as you know, we have HCAPS. Okay. So we um, we have we have great measures, and we can we can and, and indicators that let us know whether or not we're improving or stagnating. In which case, we course correct, and that that's entirely Deming's um, framework. Uh, and, and what about um, uh, other contemporaries? Uh, getting back to kind of the first know, part of my question. Yeah, I, so I guess in terms of, when I think of you know, who really uh, has made an impact on my life or my career and, and um, influenced me to change how I look at things or do things, I would have to say Quint Studer of the Studer Group. Yeah, t tell me a little bit about that group. Yeah, and I'll tell you why. Because if you recall Joel Barker's work uh, on paradigm shifts in the okay. 80s, okay, so Joel Barker said something that I've always thought was, was really important, and he said that paradigm shifts usually don't occur within a um, professional arena. They, they, they're not usually, how did he say that? They're, not, they're usually external to the work that's being done. So someone outside your field comes in and you get revolutionary change. If you're working inside your field, you probably are getting incremental change. Right. So along comes Quint Studer, and he was not in healthcare, he was in education. And he, he jumped from education over to healthcare and had this idea of improving patient satisfaction. And he did create revolutionary change in terms of getting results and sustaining results that those of us that were inside healthcare couldn't quite uh, couldn't quite get. And so he, he's one of the role models I look to because he has uh, a framework, again, that works, that if you follow it, you get results and you can get re sustained results. Is, is there something that's uh, an example you can give, uh, some sort of quintessential studer technique, or for lack of a better word. Yeah, he has um, six must-haves, and this is the other thing I like about his work. Um, his work is um, based in behavior modification, which is a model that is tried and true uh, from evidence-based level, um, and he has six must-haves. 
which anyone who's used the Studer model is familiar with the six must-haves. They're things like rounding with purpose, writing thank you notes, um, you know, doing um, evaluations. And if you follow those six must-haves, chances are, and, and you refine them, not change them, but refine them, chances are you're going to get those same results and you're going to sustain results. And um, we implemented those at Sutter Davis Hospital and I have to say we did get results and we did sustain results. Was there a defining moment for you in terms of what patient care is supposed to be, something that, that shifted you from a purely clinical look to a more holistic look. Was there some point in, in, in your career that really tipped you over the edge there? Mm. You know, that's uh, the way I look at it is, I don't know if there was a moment, but there was a reality for me that when I was a nurse, and I was taking care of my patients. I knew I wanted my patients to get the very best care when they were in my hands. When I moved to a manager, I felt the same way about my department. In this department, we're gonna provide the very best care and I could make that happen in my department because I was managing it. When I became a CNE, a chief nurse, I knew I could do that hospital-wide and I felt very good about that. And then when I had the opportunity to become a CEO, I thought how great would it be to provide health care to a community and really know that you were doing the absolute best that you could for the people in that community. And so I guess the defining moment was really reflecting on what kind of influence can you have in the healthcare delivery arena that would make a difference to more than just one patient or a department, but a whole community. And I feel like Sutter Davis Hospital has achieved that. Not every CEO comes up from the trenches. Do you think, do you think that sometimes when they do come up from the trenches that they forget what it was like to be down there. I mean, you've kind of indicated that for yourself, that same mentality you had, had as a nurse, you brought with you all the way to the top so that, that, so that patient care was, was central. Do you think that always happens? No, I don't think it always happens, and I think, I don't know why it doesn't. I think it's easy to forget what it's like working 3 to 11 or maybe 11 to 7 on a Saturday night when you don't have all the resources around you. I was a 3 to 11 nurse in a, an emergency department, so I was a trauma nurse. And um, the one thing I promised myself was that I would never, ever, ever forget what it was like to work on 3 to 11 on a busy shift. Um, no matter where I went or what I was doing, I never wanted to forget what my staff was doing. Uh, and often, I, and I do think about it a lot, um, because the, the staff are the ones who make it happen every day for every patient, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I know in, in, in today's economy, everybody's struggling to, to make ends meet. Healthcare is no different. How do you manage the, the, the satisfaction, uh, uh, the work satisfaction for, for your nursing staff when things are kind of always in flux. Mm -hmm. One of the things, going back to one of the things we talked about earlier, um, involvement so that they know how they, how they can participate and how they can contribute and letting them know that they are in fact contributing. I think that one of the greatest rewards uh, is to recognize staff for what they contribute and let them know they're doing a good job. When they know they're doing a good job and they feel fulfilled professionally, they're more likely to engage even more. And that, that's one of the, um, I think the keys to creating a workforce that's satisfied is, is to make sure that everyone is engaged and participating and they know that they're all contributing contributing and it's contributing positively. It seems like one of the one of the trends in healthcare right right now and for good reason is you know decreasing uh, the amount of time you you wait in the office or decreasing ER wait times mm -hmm. uh, decreasing um, you know in hospital uh, stay times length of stay. Um, by any chance is any of that contributing into moving patients maybe too quickly? through the system? Actually, there's always a balance. There's always a balance that we look for in that. And um, one of the things that, for, I'll give you a good example. So for example, we might want to decrease a length of stay, but we're also watching how many times a patient might come back to the emergency room or how many times they might get readmitted say within 30 days or within any amount of days. So there's always balancing measures that you can look at as well to say maybe we should keep a patient an extra half a day for a certain diagnosis 
because now we have so much evidence-based medicine that we're able to look at specific diagnoses and say what's an average length of stay for pneumonia what's an average length of stay you know and that that's given that there are no co comorbidities sure. and things but but the fact of the matter is is we have lots of data and and I think we also have better relationships with our outpatient doctors and follow-up um, and I think the more that we get into the Affordable Care Act, you're going to see a lot more management on the outpatient side that's a, tied a little more closely to inpatient. We're not all going to be our individual silos. We're going to be a continuum of care for the patients. And um, so, no, there are balancing measures, and I think we're acutely aware of the fact that we don't want to let patients go home too early just because we want to decrease length of stay. Absolutely not. In terms of what you're doing here at, at Sutter as CEO, where do you want to lead the uh, Sutter Davis from here? Okay. Well, we're very excited about where we're going. Um, we have a couple things in mind. Um, we've been able to get great results, like you said, in the, and we've been in the top 10th percentile of the country in most areas. And I think the one area that um, we're going to focus on next is in that whole patient safety arena. Um, the IOM, the, the Institute of Medicine, came out with a study oh, years ago. And I think that there are still too many articles written about um, safety in hospitals, like wrong side surgeries, medication errors, things like that. Um, and I think there's a lot to do in that safety arena at the bedside with patients in the acute care setting and even in the outpatient setting. So that's going to be one of the areas where we apply all of our Baldrige knowledge and all of our experience and really look at being the, maybe the safest hospital in the United States. That'd be great. Well, Janet, thank you for spending uh, some time with us today. You're welcome. Thank you.